Hello, my friends, and welcome to the free massive open online course on freedom of expression, artificial intelligence, and elections. This course is organized by the Ninth Center for Journalism in the Americas with the support of UNESCO and UNDP. My name is Albertina Peterbar. I'm an electoral expert at the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists section at UNESCO and the lead instructor of this course. So welcome. I'm very happy that you're here today. And let's start by module one. So we are going to start with module one. Module one is organized in three different parts. It's, each part is going to be presented by a different specialist. First part is going to be uh, on the foundational principles and key components on international standards on freedom of expression and access to information. And it's going to be me, as I said. And then part two is going to be our colleague Pratik Sival from Program Specialist from Digital Policies and Digital Transformation section of UNESCO. And finally, part three will be uh, presented by the electoral expert Tatiana Monet from the Bureau of Policy and Program Support of UNDP. So let's move to part one and go directly to the topic that you know that access to artificial intelligence tools has become massive only recently for the general public, but artificial intelligence at itself has been with us for a long time already. The difference now is that it opens possibilities for to generate uh, synthetic content based on prompts or indications entered by the user uh, in a very quickly manner and a very large scale, uh, created a revolution in the way people access information, produce, receive, and interact with content. And this is this aspect of artificial intelligence, which is not the only one. This is just a small a small aspect of artificial intelligence can affect a, a democratic processes and, el and electoral processes. So. With billions of human beings connected, that of course information and harmful contents combined with the new tools, uh, the tools um, powered by artificial intelligence, it's uh, it really can create um, a, a huge issue for democracies. And this is why it's so important for electoral bodies, electoral practitioners, and stakeholders to understand these new technologies and in order to safeguard the integrity and credibility of electoral processes, electoral institutions, and democratic institutions. So there are at least three critical uh, areas or issues that need to be addressed. Uh, one of them, of course, is the harmful content itself, online harmful content. That, didn't it did exist before in the form of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, hate speech. This is not new, but it can really be created and disseminated in a super large scale. The other dimension that is really important to address in the context of elections, of course, is the safety of all actors involved, including candidates, voters, political party leaders, journalists, and other media actors. And the third point is to take into consideration disrupted practices that can affect electoral campaigning and electoral communication. So, to understand how to address these issues, we need to also address the fundamental role of freedom of expression and access to reliable information for democracies, in particular during electoral process. And we need to address disinformation and hate speech, of course, but we need to do that while protecting them, while protecting these fundamental rights. So I know it sounds easy, but it's, it is extremely complicated. Why it's so complicated? Because with artificial intelligence, uh, it, things have changed in a way that can be very productive, but also can be very challenging. And we are, and what we are represented, these challenges are represented what we call the four Bs for artificial intelligence, volume, velocity, virality, and verosimilitude. Volume refers to the exponential increase in the amount of information available, which makes it difficult for people to identify truthful information from this information. Velocity refer is referring to the speed at which this, this content, this information, it's being shared. 
And virality stands for the idea and the capacity of artificial intelligence in targeting particular groups and profiles, profiling the, the, the target audience. And verosimilitude, to the last one, it's related to the ability of artificial intelligence to create um, synthetic content that can look like uh, the real thing. And all these characteristics together create a, a, a very, very complicated uh, landscape for users, voters, and for all electoral stakeholders in the, in the um, fight for truthful information, really relevant for making a right decision to vote for a good candidates and avoid and avoid emotional manipulation. Uh, operating in this new environment, uh, it's as I mentioned many times before, it's very challenging, but we need to take into consideration the basis, the basics of this. We need to go back to the origins and we need to understand that we are our, our right to freedom of expression is protected so it, it doesn't mean that whatever content someone does does not like can be cut by for instance an internet company or a state no it needs the, the, this the, the information needs to be protected and that's why it's very important to remember that freedom of expression is uh, it's mentioned in Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, with because it is referred as the right for everyone to have an opinion, express, or have uh, um, without interference, and also the right to seek, receive, and impart information. Not only to produce information, but also the right to receive information and to look for information are very important to take into consideration. The same happens. Another important uh, element of this framework is the Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And that's something that we need to take into consideration when thinking the ways of, of addressing the um, information pollution created uh, by these new tools. But of course, no, there is uh, there is also important to know that freedom of expression is not an absolute right and can and sometimes must be restricted. However, these restrictions are very limited and need to be done under international standards. And they must fall into very narrow uh, criteria and they need to be justified and needs to be, um, they need to pass what is called the three part test that these restrictions must be provided by law. The second is that they must pursue a legitim legitimate aim and also, they need to have a legitimate purpose. So there are three elements that combine, and depending on different contexts and different legal frameworks of different countries, this right might be uh, restricted. So this, this is a very important point because it is also protecting what we call at UNESCO the information as a public good. That means it's not only my right, to to express freedom or receive or or seek for information, but also the information as a whole, it's a it's a public good, and and in in this in this perspective, it's in which UNESCO operates, and also it's the perspective of the United Nations in general. So, what are our main takes away of this first part of the first module? Well, that artificial intelligence is a game changer that creates a lot of issues and it's very difficult to, to tackle what uh, I, I would say is this, um, this um, amplification of information pollution and the production and dissemination of synthetic content has changed a lot and it affecting democratic processes. Um, the amount of information available and the quality of this information makes it more difficult for users and for voters and for stakeholders in general to be able to differentiate what is true of what is not and what is the origin of this content. And the targeting of the micro-targeting, it's becoming more, uh, more serious and affects also because users don't know, are not aware of that. In this context, the, the, the freedom of expression needs to be 
a priority. It needs to be protected. It needs to be um, it needs to be really framed in cases that there are actors that want to say, okay, this content does is not true, or this content does not belong. It's not uh, respecting the law, or uh, or it's not just simply that you don't like a content that you're going to prohibit it. So. It's a very complex process. I hope this helped. And now we're going to go to a coffee break. And my colleague Pratik Sibal is going to take part of this. It's going to present the second part where he's going to talk about in more detail what it is. Uh, it's the definition of artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Albertina, for the introduction to International Standards on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information. Hello, everyone. My name is Pratik Sivil, and I work at the intersection of artificial intelligence and governance at UNESCO. In part two of this module, we are going to talk about the basics of artificial intelligence, the different kinds of AI systems, and some of the ethical concerns related to these systems. The idea is not for us to become technical experts on AI, but really to develop an intuition about this technology and the way it works. However, before we begin, I have a small activity. So if you have a pen and a piece of paper around you, I will invite you to pause the video and write down three examples of AI that you come across in your daily life. Well, welcome back. So as you may have noticed, AI is quite literally all around us. So if you are watching, for instance, a TV series or a movie on Netflix, you would have seen that Netflix is proposing uh, films or shows for you to watch. And this is based on Netflix recommendation algorithm that really looks at our past data and tells us what we may like in the future. So if you are a fan of romantic comedies, well, there it is for you. You are going to get a lot of romantic comedy recommendations from Netflix. Then we've also seen in emails, while we are composing our messages, uh, we sometimes see that the, the email, whatever platform you're using, whether it's Gmail or something else, is proposing words to complete our sentence. This is basically an AI system that is predicting the next word based on the logical sequence that should follow while we are writing our sentence. Then another example is the good old spam filter, actually, which screens irrelevant emails is also an AI system. And then uh, in our homes, workplaces, or on, on our mobile devices, we have uh, these digital voice assistants, which get activated when we use the keyword. And then uh, we can ask them about the weather, and then they will give us an appropriate response. These are AI systems. And finally, uh, and quite excruciatingly, uh, if you would have gone onto some of these online uh, websites where we have a chatbot where you want to ask for information, uh, these are AI systems which are processing our questions, coming back with, with some responses to us. And sometimes those responses don't make sense, and sometimes they're quite good. And finally, let us not forget that on social media platforms, uh, we have uh, AI systems that really tailor content of our news feeds. And in short, we are really surrounded by AI systems in our everyday life. Before we dive deeper, let us start really with the question of what is intelligence? So we're not really talking about artificial intelligence yet, but just what is intelligence? Uh, all of us are intelligent beings, and really the ability to learn, uh, use our knowledge to solve problems, and in a manner that is appropriate to the context can be defined as intelligence. So for instance, uh, certainly throwing oil on a car that has caught fire is not intelligent. Moving on, let's let's have a look at this video which explains artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence enabled the development of invaluable services and is taking part in more and more aspects of our lives. Built from data, algorithms, hardware, and connectivity, AI enables machines to imitate human intelligence, like perception, problem solving, language interaction, or even creativity. 
These technologies are helping the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. For example, AI improves teaching in rural areas that lack resources by analyzing students' learning and providing them with better learning tools. UNESCO's Rome principles guide AI's development to make sure it is human rights-based, open, accessible, nurtured by multi-stakeholder governance and inclusive, especially gender-wise. Watch the next episode to know more about human rights and AI. Thanks. So we have linked the videos to the lecture notes as well. So if you want to follow up and watch more videos, feel free to do so. Uh, just to summarize, so artificial intelligence uh, is really machines that process data and information in a way that resembles intelligent behavior. So these machines are really capable of doing several tasks, for instance, reasoning, learning, uh, they perceive the environment, so perception, and then they use all these uh, attributes to predict. Just a fun fact, so the term AI was coined in 1955 by Professor John McCarthy, who defined it simply as science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And often we actually forget uh, in history of technology uh, women pioneers, and Ada Lovelace was one such pioneer who way back in 1837 was the first programmer. So I'd invite you to look up uh, and read more about her in the article that we've linked up in the lecture notes. In the video, we also heard the term algorithm. And in general, we often hear this term in the context of social media. So what is an algorithm? An algorithm is basically a series of step-by-step -step instructions given to a machine to perform specific tasks. So the algorithms take inputs and then they follow defined steps and produce expected outputs. This is as simply, and we've looked at this term in our high school mathematics courses as well, is the same algorithm. And moving on, uh, Generative AI is, is one of the most talked about terms these days, and especially since the launch of ChatGPT. So what is Gen AI? Uh, these are AI systems that generate high quality text, images, videos, and even code or other content based on large amounts of data that they have been trained on. And many of these tools are available for free online for you to experiment to generate videos and images. In fact, Albertina has used several of uh, AI generated images in, this, uh, in the slides for this course. Just as an activity in the forum, if you, if you would like to try out uh, please go and use one of the free Gen AI tools, uh, try to produce images or text, and write down and share with, uh, with your peers here what are some of the challenges that you may be facing while, in terms of the outputs of these tools. Let us now consider the types of AI systems, and we'll really consider two broad categories here. First are rules-based AI systems that tell a machine to perform certain actions by satisfying really a series of if and then statements. Now imagine in the context of elections, for instance, that you have to decide whether the person, whether a person is eligible to vote or not. For this, we will need to ask a series of questions. Is the person a citizen? If yes, then they are above, and then are they above the age of 18? If, that, if yes, then they are allowed to vote. So these AI systems are called also expert systems because they require subject matter experts to define these rules, uh, to code them into the machine, and then they interact with the real environment, with the data that we input, and then respond accordingly. Another example is machine learning, which is a set of techniques that enables machines to learn automatically uh, using patterns and deductions that they derive from data. So basically, if you want to de de develop an AI system that can detect if a given image is that of a dog or a cat, we have to train the AI system with a lot of images which are labeled as dogs or cats. And then the AI will learn uh, the characteristics which differentiate uh, each of the images and, and will be able to identify whether it's a dog or a cat. We've seen 
these are kind of the broad categories of artificial intelligence. And we've seen also a lot of uh, AI related concerns in the news. For instance, they're talking about facial recognition systems, which are often misidentifying women or people of color. Or we've looked at algorithms which are used to determine whether someone should get a loan or not, which may be discriminatory against certain social groups. So they, these systems are also raising a lot of ethical concerns. Let's look at some of these uh, a little briefly. So let's talk about bias and discrimination. As we just saw that AI systems are trained on large amounts of data, if this data has biases, then the outputs of these systems would reflect these biases. So for as an example, uh, a big tech company was using an AI system as part of its hiring processes. And this system was screening the CVs that were coming into the company. However, the system was trained on past CVs, and as it happened, the company was selecting more men than women. So the AI system learned that the more successful attributes in a CV are found in those of men. As a result, the algorithm, the hiring system, was, disc was downgrading the CVs of women. So this is a clear example of how real-world bias was reflected in an AI system based on a biased data set that it was fed. Another concern about AI is around transparency and explainability. So machine learning systems do not provide reasons for their outputs. They are trained on data, they identify the pattern, and then they produce the outputs. So imagine if you're using an AI system to determine whether someone is eligible for social security benefits or not, or whether you're using an AI system to determine whether someone should get bail or parole in a criminal case or not. And if this AI system doesn't provide reasons, there is a possibility for it to be in violation of the fundamental rights of these individuals. So we need to be concerned about transparency and explainability of AI systems. And finally, I'll briefly touch upon accountability, which is another challenge of AI. Who is accountable for the decisions that an AI system is taking? Is it the programmers? Is it the company that is developing the AI system? Or is it the users? For example, if a driverless car meets with an accident, who is responsible for this accident? There is a lot of ongoing research around these issues, both at the technical level and also at governance level. Speaking of which, uh, we have uh, the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, which is a global standard which was adopted by 193 countries in 2021. And this standard outlines the principles that should guide the development of AI. Some of these principles are proportionality and do no harm. AI systems should be safe and secure. They should be privacy protecting. They should ensure accountability. They should always have a human or human in the loop, and then they should be transparent and explainable. I would invite you to look at the recommendation on the ethics of AI in the course uh, readings, and also in case you're developing an AI system or using an AI system to conduct an ethical impact assessment, for which we've also linked the UNESCO methodology to two ethical impact assessments. With this, we're coming to the close of this uh, part. Just to recap some key takeaways, AI systems are basically mimicking intelligent behavior through reasoning, learning, perception, prediction, and AI systems are of different types. Some are rules-based uh, and some are that are developed by human experts or based on large amounts of data where they discover the patterns and produce the outputs. And finally, it is also important to remember that there are several ethical challenges associated with these systems in the form of bias, discrimination, transparency, and accountability. And we need to be cautious when we are putting them to use. With this, thank you for joining me in this module and looking forward to speaking to you soon. Welcome back. I'm Tatiana Monet, electoral expert at UNDP's Bureau for Policy and Program Support in New York. We just heard about the main features of AI. The rapid transformation which AI operates on the society, the economy, and governments has been recently accelerated with the development of generative AI. The development of AI can be used in a variety of ways, and technologies are never neutral. 
In this session, I will briefly touch upon the key principles identified so far to harness the potential of AI and address its risks for society, for democratic governance, election, and information integrity. The electoral process and the information ecosystem are part of the wider democratic governance and fabric of a country, and both are particularly vulnerable to the impact of AI and both can benefit from its increased capacities. Let's look at the UN renewed efforts in this field. The Secretary General created a high-level multi-stakeholder advisory body on artificial intelligence in October 2023. It is composed of 32 experts in relevant disciplines from around the world to bring, to bring diverse perspectives and options for the governance of AI for the common good in line with international human rights law and the sustainable development goals. The starting point of its interim report includes two main points in, to sum up. One, if AI technologies are being harnessed responsibly, they could be made accessible to all, including the developing countries that need them the most. However, as things stand, AI expertise is concentrated in a handful of companies and countries which could deepen global inequalities and divides. Second point, AI can scale up and amplify the work of governments, civil society, and the UN across the board by, for instance, rolling out public services more efficient, efficiently or by predicting and addressing crises more rapidly. However, the potential harmful effects of AI include serious concerns over, over misinformation, disinformation, the entrenching of bias and discrimination, surveillance and invasion of privacy, fraud, and other violations of human rights. The high-level advisory body also distinguishes three types of risk of AI. The first one are, is related to technical, technical limitation of AI, such as harmful bias, lack, lack of accuracy, or AI hallucinations. The second one is related to the harmful AI product initiated by humans. Deep fakes, hostile information campaigns are some of the examples. Third, the result of a human-machine interaction and excessive trust in AI systems, such as automation bias, and also the potential of de-skilling of humans over time because of this over-reliance on technology, uh, is the third um, risk mentioned. Finally, the high-level body uh, advisory body reminds us that the international human rights law should help guide the balancing act between harnessing the potential of AI and mitigating its risk. For instance, international human rights law as is guides national and regional jurisdiction in addressing discriminations. This session of the MOOC is also another, has given an illustration of the existing robust human rights uh, framework for a healthy information ecosystem during election. The Summit of the Future, scheduled for September 2024, aims at complementing the multilateral framework with a global digital compact to better capture the needs created by the introduction of AI. The UN Interagency Working Group on AI, under UNESCO's leadership, will also further this work. Efforts are also underway to include international principles into regional commitments and legislations, with very visible steps in the European Union on data privacy, digital services, and AI. A series of initial regulations have been also initiated in specific countries, still subject to debate. Voluntary commitments by stakeholders, such as the recent accord among global technological companies, or commitments by national electoral stakeholders are also complementing these efforts with various level of effects. All these contextual initiatives are expected to continue to shape in different manners and scale how AI will impact elections and the information ecosystem. 
While addressing the risk, there are also ongoing efforts for using AI to strengthen governance processes. For instance, as part of its support, UNDP is developing AI research, digital infrastructure, digital upskilling to help ensure AI products are relevant and beneficial and used in a responsible manner by governance to serve people's interests and bridge the digital gap. You will find a video provided by UNDP Chief Digital Office, can, getting into more details on the AI readiness assessment for governance as part of this module package. AI can also enhance effectiveness of democratic governance and in institutions. Promoting an inclusive approach to the adoption of digital technologies, bringing together not just governments and businesses, but also civil society, academia, citizens, in the decision-making process are critical steps to put citizens back in the center of those decision-making processes. Ensuring that the design and development of AI products can better take into consideration the potential bias and adverse effect is another way to avoid leaving vulnerable groups behind. AI tools can also be made available for enhancing participation and engagement. With 2.7 billion people offline, 95% of whom reside in developing countries, and with only 65 young women accessing the internet for every 100 young men, it is essential to have the voices of all citizens heard and to inform their decisions. AI can also enable individuals to, to make data-driven decisions, promote transparency, and improve accountability while carefully mitigating the risk. The UNDP Global Program Governance for People and Planet is guiding these efforts. And you can find an in-depth discussion in the publication towards a shared vision for technology and governance in Annex. In the next modules, you will get also more details on how um, all this impacts the electoral process and, provide, and we will provide you with more concrete illustration of tools and solutions. Thank you for your attention. Dear friends, thank you so much for being there with us today. I hope that you enjoyed our first module of the MOOC. I remind you that if you want to go deeper in any of the topics that we addressed today, you can find more readings and videos in the complimentary resources section. Next week, we will go through module two that is going to address disinformation, technology facilitated gender-based violence and hate speech in elections. The first part of the module, we're going to, uh, to address uh, the electoral cycle approach that is really important in terms of understanding how to frame these topics within the electoral processes. We are also going to talk about how to understand and identify disinformation, misinformation and hate speech within the electoral cycle, of course. And then we're going to talk about technology facilitated gender based violence in era of generative AI for political participation and elections for women, girls, and other vulnerable and vulnerable groups in general. So thank you very much. Uh, as I said before, very happy to see that you were here today with us. This is very important for us that you keep moving ahead with the MOOC. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm sure uh, I'm going to see you here next week. Bye-bye. <music>